Good evening. Welcome to Holy Cross and thank you for being with us as we begin a new church year with our first Sunday in Advent. I have a few additions to our prayer requests. One is Pam McDougall. Uh, Pam has actually been quite ill for some time, um, but uh, it, it has gotten to be enough a part of her life that she would like to be added publicly to our bulletin prayers, to our prayer of the church. Um, and she's uh, anticipating an MRI on Monday that should hopefully provide some answers and get her toward a resolution. Uh, but for now, we'll pray for Pam, for her health and well-being, and for her deliverance from this illness. Also, um, Marsha Klinkner was hospitalized with um, an emergency major surgery on Wednesday from which she is now recovering. She's out of danger, she's okay, and uh, we'll, we're hopeful that she'll experience a full recovery, but we do pray for Marcia. Also, Linda Renahan, sister of Dave Lorman, uh, we prayed for a, a while ago because of a, a persistent knee infection that did resolve. Unfortunately, that infection has returned. Um, so we'll continue to lift her up in prayer. Also, her husband, Dave's brother-in-law, Richard Renahan, is diagnosed with, uh, with cancer in his lymph nodes. Um, it is in, in multiple locations. Um, so we pray for his patience in this affliction and encouragement and for his healing and deliverance. A note about our schedule going forward. We are entering into the season of midweek services. For the past 10 years, um, we've had 2 and 7 p.m. services during Lent, but only 7 p.m. services during Advent. However, starting this year, we're going to do the same thing for both seasons. We're going to have 2 and 7 p.m. for both Advent and Lent. So if 2 p.m. works better for you, this is your opportunity to participate in our Advent midweek services. Um, and my intention is to live stream the 2 p.m. service, um, and, and that'll be kind of a backup so that if, we, uh, if there's anything wrong with it, we'll have opportunity to live stream then the 7 p.m. service as well. Uh, but for purposes of those who are gathering for in-person worship, um, 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. every Wednesday throughout the season of Advent. And given the timing of Christmas this year, we have the opportunity for four Advent midweek services. Uh, so we're looking forward to that additional time together as the body of Christ. We have decoration coming up this Monday afternoon at 1.30. Um, I'm sure we've all seen and enjoyed, appreciated the, the beauty of this sanctuary when uh, decorated for the Advent and Christmas season. So if you'd like to take uh, a part in making that happen, do plan to be here at 1.30, or I guess I would recommend uh, the way things go, being here somewhat before 1.30. Um, and then uh, we'll all work together to get our sanctuary de uh, decorated for this upcoming season. So that's uh, 1.30 on Monday afternoon, our church decorating. And then um, we also have scheduled a GBA Christmas party. The GBA stands for Get Better Acquainted. And it's an opportunity for our church members and friends to gather in the homes of some of our members uh, in an informal setting, enjoy uh, a nice meal with uh, lots of sides brought by generous guests. Um, we were not able to hold that normally last year, but this year the GBA is being held at the Peels, at Wayne and Shirley Peels. And that's scheduled for Friday, December 17th at 5.30. So uh, I look forward to seeing many of us there. Is anyone aware of anything else that needs to be announced this evening? If not, I think we're ready to begin with our opening hymn for Advent, number 331, The Advent of Our King, and we will rise for our opening hymn. i 
advent of our King, our prayers must now employ, and we must hymns of welcome sing in strains of holy joy. The everlasting Son incarnate deigns to be himself a servant's form put son to set his servants free. O Zion's daughter, rise to meet your lowly King. No, let your faithless heart despise the peace he comes to bring. As judge on clouds of light, he soon will come again, and his true members all unite with him in heaven to reign. Before the dawning day, let sin's dark deeds be gone, the sinful self be put away, the new self now put on. All glory to the Son, who comes to set us free. Father, Spirit, ever one, through all eternity. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me not be put to shame. Let not mine enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not mine enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture reading. The Old Testament reading for the first Sunday in Advent is from Jeremiah chapter 23. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, As the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country, and out of all the countries where he had driven them. Then they shall dwell in their own land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Romans chapter 13. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in fornication and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the Holy Gospel. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. 
The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ! We confess together our holy Christian faith according to the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for our hymn of the day, number 334, O Lord, how shall I meet you? and fallen race. 
sin's debt that fearful burden cannot his love erase. Your guilt the Lord will pardon and cover by his grace. He comes for you procuring the peace of sin forgiven. His children thus securing eternal life in heaven. He comes to judge the nations, a terror to his foes, a light of consolations and blessed hope to those who love the Lord's appearance. Glorious sun now come, send forth your beams so cheering, and guide us safely home. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this evening is our Gospel lesson for the first Sunday in Advent from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter, the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, especially St. Matthew's quotation from the prophet Zechariah, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. This is the text. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Christ Jesus, as I was first preparing this weekend's sermon, I thought I'd really like to talk with my congregation about how we prepare for the coming of Jesus. I thought I might compare and contrast our preparation for Jesus coming with our preparation for the Christmas celebration. I thought I might use the preparations for the triumphal entry to compare and contrast with how we get ready for the coming of Jesus. But it occurred to me, for one thing, that would be a very similar sermon to when I preached just a couple of weeks ago. And secondly, simply telling you all how you should prepare may not be quite as effective as actually giving you the means of thus preparing. And what is the means of preparing for the coming of Jesus? Well, really, it's the coming of Jesus itself. Jesus comes to us, and by coming to us, he forms us into the sort of people that he would have us be. I need to clarify, though, not every coming of Jesus is like this. Many comings of Jesus bring about very different reactions than he might be fostering among us tonight. Because Jesus has come and does come in many different ways. And not all of those are ways that we might be that eager for. I wish to take some time to reflect on other ways, other times that Jesus has come, both to his own people and to his enemies, so that as we compare that with how Jesus comes to us now, he will by the sheer contrast, form us ever more deeply into his own image. How has Jesus come in the past? Let's look back at the coming to Mount Sinai, when Moses had led the people of Israel safely out of slavery in Egypt, across the Red Sea, the waters mounting up on either side of them like walls, led by a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day, 
until they come to Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, in the wilderness. And there, on Mount Sinai, on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. How did the people react to this coming of God to Mount Sinai? Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid, reasonably enough afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So in this coming of God, and yes, I can say this is a coming of Jesus, because Jesus is, of course, one God with his Father. It is God who came to Mount Sinai to confront his people. In this coming of Jesus to Mount Sinai, there is darkness, there is rumbling, there is thunder, In lightning, there is fire and smoke. The seemingly secure mountains quaking before his dreadful presence. And this coming of Jesus to Mount Sinai was enough to fill his people with terror, with fear. This was a coming to give the law to tell his people how God expected them to live and to inform them how he expected to punish them if they did not live accordingly. This was a terrifying coming that led his people to tremble, but it didn't last. Not too long after this, While darkness is still covering the mountain, when the people have heard the law of God, including the law against idolatry, what do they do? They turn precisely to idolatry. They form for themselves the golden calf and worship it in place of the Lord their God. And far from trembling at the presence of Jesus come to give the law, they dance and play and cavort. The fear of God has fled far from them. Well, that coming can lead to another coming. God threatened his people. If I'm not going to scare you into compliance, into obedience by manifestations such as what happened on Mount Sinai, if you persist in your disobedience, if you will not fear me and worship me alone and live according to my law, I am going to come to you in a truly destructive and terrifying way. And sure enough, after many generations of disobedience, God came to his people in the form of foreign armies. The armies of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon laid siege to Jerusalem, 
threw down the walls of the city, leveled the temple, the site of God's gracious presence among his people, and punished them with the wrath of God himself. And this was to be repeated in an even more severe and permanent form at the destruction of Jerusalem under the Romans after the coming of Jesus to his people in flesh. Yes, the coming of the Romans to lay siege to Jerusalem to destroy once more and forever the holy city was the coming of Jesus to judge his people and condemn them for their persistent disobedience. Armies surrounding the holy city, fire and sword, bloodshed, famine and heartbreak. Even that could not lead to lasting repentance among that people. Thankfully, that's not how Jesus is coming to us tonight. There is no burning fire. There is no thunder and lightning. There is no quaking earth beneath our feet. There is no rumbling voice commanding us to keep his law or perish, nor are there armies surrounding us to lay siege to us and destroy us. No, Jesus comes to us tonight in a very different way. Before, though, we come to that coming of Jesus, I wish to reflect on yet another way that Jesus has come to his people. I wonder if you've recently read this account of the coming of Jesus for his people. In Psalm 18, King David cries out for salvation from his enemies, from King Saul, and God answers. And we read in Psalm 18, From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The fountains also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds dark with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire, and he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. What a powerful, what a mighty image of the coming of Jesus. And this coming is different from the coming to Mount Sinai, very different from the coming to Jerusalem in foreign armies. This is a coming not for law-giving, not to terrify his own people into submission. This was a coming for deliverance. Deliverance of David from his enemies, which is a literary preview of the coming that we all anticipate there is a coming of Jesus to which we look forward that will be very similar to what we just read from Psalm 18. Jesus will come enthroned on clouds of glory, attended by myriads of holy ones, and he will terrify the wicked. He will scatter the enemies of his people. He will come in all of his power and might, all of his glory and splendor, and he will judge the nations of the earth. He will defeat death once and for all, and he will receive us 
who trust in him into his kingdom. I very much look forward to that coming of Jesus. And we are, of course, to prepare for that coming. It is helpful for us to rehearse it in our minds and hearts, to anticipate it, to recognize that it is real. It is on the way. There will be a time appointed by God when Jesus will come in this manner. But when he comes in this manner, it will be too late to make any sort of change. It will be too late to say in that moment, oh, I guess now would be a good time for me to repent. No, at that coming, there is only terror for the wicked and deliverance for the righteous, for those whose faith in Jesus has made them righteous in his sight. Again, how different that coming of Jesus from the way he comes to us tonight. How does Jesus come to us tonight? There are, of course, no donkeys here this evening. And yet, the spirit, if you will, of a donkey is here with us tonight. That spirit being meekness and humility. You wouldn't know by looking at our sanctuary this evening. You wouldn't know by looking at our altar where under the veil are bread and wine prepared to be the vehicle of Jesus coming to us. You would not know by looking at this humble book that the God of heaven and earth has come to us tonight. Nor would you know by looking at the donkey coming over from the Mount of Olives that that donkey's creator, the creator of all the universe, was coming to dwell among his people. You wouldn't know it, but that doesn't make it any less true. Jesus came in humility, in meekness, in gentleness, in peace, to be among his people, to be handed over to his people, crucified and killed by his people, so that he might thus make atonement for the sin of his people. And not for those only, but for the sin of the entire world. And then having made atonement, rise again from the dead in righteousness and peace. Jesus comes to us now in humility, in meekness, in lowliness, in a way that is very easily despised. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus came at the triumphal entry, it was very easy to despise and even kill him. Some 30 years earlier, when he came through the virgin, the, the womb of the Virgin Mary, it would have been easy for Herod to kill him, if not for the interposition of the holy angel who warned Joseph in a dream. In his first coming, his first advent, Jesus came in a vulnerable state, a lowly state, an easily resisted state, but a state that in those who heard his word and believed it brought about the kind of reception that God is looking for among his people. A people who could not be terrified into submission by his coming on Mount Sinai, a people who would not be persuaded by armies surrounding the holy city. A people who could not be changed by witnessing him coming on clouds of glory. Could nevertheless be changed by the might of the spirit of God. Who comes in the lowliness and humility of the humble Christ. Through his first humble coming in his birth, in his triumphal entry, Jesus brought about for himself a people that was converted to him by his word. 
and specifically by his gospel, by the pardoning word, the word I am come, not to judge and condemn, but to save, righteous and bearing salvation. And tonight, Jesus comes in this way. He's not coming to us in earthquake, in fire, in storm. He's not pouring out his hailstones and coals of fire upon us. He's not overwhelming us with the splendor of his majesty. He's not terrifying us into submission. Rather, he is speaking to us gently and meekly by his word, telling us, I am here for you. I am here for your sake. I am here not to condemn, but to forgive. I am here to pour out my mercy and my peace upon you. Let's simply rejoice and bask in this coming of our Lord Jesus this evening. And give thanks that he comes to us in his word to forgive us by his suffering and death and resurrection on our behalf. Let us rejoice that he comes to us in his body and blood under the humble forms of bread and wine that we might find in this sacrament pardon and peace. Let us rejoice that he comes to us by his spirit who has kindled in us faith in the Son of God, trust in his gospel, a spirit who dwells within us now by our baptism into Christ and conforms us ever more closely to the image of Jesus. And then, having been thus prepared by the Spirit of God through his word, as Jesus comes to us in meekness and in peace, we will be ready for that rather more impressive coming, a coming that will result in the judgment of his enemies, our deliverance from sin and death, but also the fulfillment of what he promises us right now, mercy and peace in his presence and entry into the kingdom which he has won for us and prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise for prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the faithful proclamation of Christ's saving name, that God's people may be strengthened in the true faith and his kingdom extended, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the holy Christian church throughout the world and for all who confess the name of Christ, that God would guard and defend us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our flesh. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, its mission, and its people, for the ability to meet the needs that arise as we do the work God has given us to do, and for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the schools of our society and for the educational institutions of our synod, for our preschools, our day schools and high schools, our colleges and universities, and for our seminaries, that those who teach and those who learn in them would be kept from all harm and danger of body and soul, preserved from all error, and transformed by the wisdom of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who partake this day of Christ's holy body and blood, that in their eating and drinking they may receive the benefits of forgiveness of sins and the renewal of life, and have a foretaste of the feast to come, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who have wandered from the faith, that the Holy Spirit would bring us to repentance and use us to call them home to the Father, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our government and all who have been set into positions of leadership, that they may use the authority entrusted to them honorably and for the good of their people, 
to the maintenance of righteousness and to the hindrance and punishment of wickedness, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the residents of Waukesha and all of those affected by the senseless attack this past Sunday at their Christmas parade, that God would pour out upon them his comfort and peace and grant them relief in their sufferings. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, poverty, or unemployment, that God's great mercy and love would preserve and relieve them, and that he would make us the vessels of his mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the faithful, that the Spirit would lead them to cheerful, generous giving from the bounty the Lord provides to support the church and to help those in need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are sick or are in any other form of need in either body or soul, especially Pam McDougall, Linda Renahan, Richard Renahan, John Bloom, Lexi Chase, Liz Davis, Alan Hendrickson, Sherry Holmes, Marsha Klinkner, Doug Lefevre, Ashley Moeller, Susan Needham, Pastor Neuendorf, Kathy Perry, Janet Sable, Jean Sperry, Tyler Stevenson, Sheila Taylor, Norma Warner, Tyler Wentler, Harold Wilming, and Brian Yance, that God would grant healing to their bodies, and until the time of their deliverance, strength to bear their infirmities with patience and grace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our homebound members, for Barb Davis, Liz Davis, Adeline Dodds, Betty Gronbeck, June Schindler, and Joe and Jerry Spoo, that God would keep them steadfast in his word and faith and bring them safely together with us all to the joys of life everlasting in his kingdom, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who rejoice in the rich blessings of God, especially Harold Wilming, Jennifer Gilchrist, and Walt Doyle, who celebrate birthdays this week, that they may always remember the giver of every gift and give him heartfelt thanks, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the gathering of the offering. We rise as we continue with the service of the sacrament, page 208. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love, shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh, and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabaoth, adored, Heaven and earth with full acclaim Shout the glory of your name Sing Hosanna in the highest Sing Hosanna to the Lord Truly blessed is he who comes In the name of the Lord Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your boundless mercy, you sent your servant, John the Baptist, to proclaim that in Christ the kingdom of heaven draws near. With thankful hearts we pray, Come, Lord Jesus, confident that in his body and blood given us to eat and drink, we receive the forgiveness of sins and so proclaim his death until he comes again in glory. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
we rise to sing the Nunc Dimittis, page 211. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn, number 332, Savior of the Nations, come.
to the Son, our King, glory to the Spirit be, now 